The goal of this video is to explore a special trigonometric limit. This limit of sine x over x as x goes to zero is important for calculating the derivative of sine and cosine. So we're going to understand what this limit is and why. Now we'll notice the numerator goes to zero and the denominator goes to zero. So this is a zero over zero form. We can't just substitute zero in to find the limit. It's indeterminate. We're going to have to do some work. But the question is, what could we do with this? It's not obvious how to use algebra to shake this loose. And in fact, we're going to have to come up with a neat little proof that involves some geometry and trigonometry. But maybe one of the things we should first do is take a look at the graph of this on your calculator. So pick a nice window to plot sine x over x. And when you first look at the graph, you think maybe, wow, that looks like uh, the intersection there is 1. Is, is that true? Well, the, no, it can't be true because you can't plug 0 into the denominator. That just can't happen. So what's going on here? If we turn the axes off, we will actually notice there's a little hole there. And so you, when you trace at 0, you don't get a value. But near 0, you can sample some values. And you see that the closer you get to 0, the closer the value gets to 1. So a very natural guess here is that this limit equals 1. And in fact, this is true, but we want to come up with a real legitimate proof that this is the case. We don't want to have to rely on this numerical data. So let's look at the unit circle, circle of radius 1 centered at the origin. And we're going to pick an angle that's between 0 and pi over 2. So we're going to build out a ray. And because of this choice, we know that ray is going to stick out into the first quadrant. And it turns out we're going to use this fact later. And from our basic knowledge of trigonometry, we know that the side, the two sides of the triangle are cosine x and sine x, respectively. Let's build out this tangent segment um, called the length L. And we'll notice a couple similar right triangles. So L is to 1 as sine is to cosine. Sine divided by cosine is just tangent. So in fact, that length is tangent x. So we'll fill that in. So now we're going to calculate some areas. We're going to start with the area of this triangle right here. Half the base times the height, in this case, is just 1 half tan x. So let's put that result off to the side. And the next area we're going to calculate is this sector. We know that the area of a sector is half the radius squared times the angle. And remember, we've got to be measuring angle and radians for this formula to work. But we are. And the radius is very simple in this case. In fact, this area simplifies to just 1 half x. So we're going to set that off to the side as well. Finally, we're going to measure the area of this triangle. Half the base times the height, in this case, is just 1 half sine x. So we've got these three regions. And if we go back to the picture and compare them, we can see that the purple triangle is greater than the area of the blue sector, which in turn is greater than the area of the green triangle. And these are all greater than 0. So here you have this chain of inequalities. Now we can multiply through by 2 to get a new inequality. And we're going to use the fact that tan x can be written as sine over cosine. So here's this chain of inequalities. And we're going to notice that um, if you look at the reciprocal function and you pick some arguments, positive arguments, a is less than b is less than c, and you reciprocate these arguments, well, the ordering will be 1 over c is less than 1 over b is less than 1 over a. In other words, reciprocation of a string of positive arguments switches the order. So we're going to apply that in this case. We're going to reciprocate each of these terms and get a new chain of inequalities. And they're in the reversed order. And they're still all greater than 0. Now we're going to use this fact that x is between 0 and pi over 2. If that's the case, then sine x has to be positive. And if sine x is positive, then we can multiply by sine x. And we don't have to worry about the direction of the inequality changing on us. So we can multiply through by sine x, and we get this new chain of inequalities. Now we're in the home stretch for at least half of our argument. So if we took a look at the graph of the constant function 1 and the cosine function, we will notice that this inequality 
forces the graph of sine x over x to be trapped between these two, at least when x is between 0 and pi over 2. Now the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of 1 is of course 1, as is the limit of cosine x as x approaches 0 from the right. And that means that sine x over x is forced between these two graphs as x approaches 0 from the right. It's squeezed in towards this point 0, 1, and the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of sine x over x is 1. Now, we seem to have done a lot of work to find the limit of sine x over x as x approaches 0 from the right. What about from the left? So we're going to take a look at arguments between negative pi over 2 and 0. How can we do this efficiently? So we're going to use some facts about even and odd functions. Cosine of negative x is cosine x. In other words, cosine is an even function. And of course, constant functions are even also. Sine x over x, what about it? Sine x itself is an odd function because sine of negative x is equal to negative sine x. And that means that sine x over x is actually even. So what do we have? We have three even functions, which means whatever the graph looks like from 0 to pi over 2, we know that we can just flip it over the y-axis to get the graph from negative pi over 2 to 0. And of course now it's very clear that the limiting value of sine x over x as x approaches 0 from the left also has to be 1. So that limits 1 from the left, 1 from the right, and that means the flat-out limit is just 1. If you were to plot sine x over x with some nice software, you get a picture that's going to back up this uh, assertion quite nicely, and you'll see that the limiting value really does appear to be 1. Now, as a postscript, we're going to look at another useful limit that will show up when we take the derivative of sine and cosine. So we're going to look at the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine x over x. If you try to plug in 0 for x, you're going to see that this is also a 0 over 0 indeterminate form. We need to do some work. In this case, there's actually a little bit of clever algebra we can apply. We can multiply the numerator and the denominator by 1 plus cosine x. If that's not obvious as to why this should happen, it's a trick. You'd have to sort of know what's going on. But you'll notice that the numerator is 1 minus cosine squared x. And we can use the Pythagorean formula to rewrite that as sine squared x. And now you can see perhaps why we multiplied numerator and denominator by 1 plus cosine x in the first place. Because we can pull apart the limit into the product of these two terms and we can apply a limit law for products. Of course, this limit, sine x over x, as x approaches 0, we just figured out that limit is 1. This other limit isn't that bad. The numerator goes to 0, and the denominator goes to 2. So actually, this limit is just 0. And that means the product is 0, and that's our limit. So these two limits will be very handy when we go to calculate the derivative of sine and cosine.